fashion trends of 2015. So without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to the founder and CEO of Ixus, Steve O'Dard. Can you see me? <laughs> Thank you. So, I'm Steve, and um, probably to give you some context about this, trends is a really um, challenging thing because you might violently disagree with everything I say. If you do, just please don't take it on out of me personally. Don't throw me off the balcony or anything like that, because I'm sure regulations will then kick in. So to give you some context, we, we work with the whole range of publishing. So across education, across STM, across trade publishing, business information. So what I've, what I've endeavoured to do is to highlight trends that I think are applicable across all disciplines of publishing. Does that make sense? Um, but once again, I can only ever talk from my view of the world. So to give you some context, which hopefully will make a bit more sense, we work with publishing organisations to look at people, processes and technology and what the publishing organisation needs to do to change and transform to play in a digital world. So that's my world. So obviously there's going to be a bit of a bias around the trends that I'm looking at from that viewpoint. So, um, I know everybody likes the top ten, I can only think of the five. So you're going to have to make do with five, I'm afraid. So the first one is this whole um, orientation to what is commonly called smart content. And we are seeing this just coming to the top of priorities across the board in publishing. So if you think about it from a traditional point of view, the human race is really messing up the whole publishing world. You know, my mother can go on Amazon without any training and can do all of her Christmas shopping in a very intuitive way. And that is what's happening with the human society, is that we've suddenly become very, very smart at how we wish to consume information across multiple devices and from a very personalised point of view. I wish to consume information in a certain way. My son has very different preferences. And frankly, if you are not able to provide your content to the consumer in the way that they wish to consume it, you're in a lot of trouble. And so you have to track right back to when content is being created and change the DNA that is inherent in most of the publishing companies that we work with. What I mean by that is there's this still very strong product, kind of an almost print mindset to editorial, to production, to authoring. So even though somebody is authoring content or creating content, actually in the back of their mind they're thinking about the product that that content is destined to go into. And smart content is about breaking that DNA within your organisation and taking all staff on the journey to say, no, we need to be thinking in a very different way. We need to become far more agile as an organisation and that content needs to become smarter. And if you can achieve that, you are potentially going to therefore have top line growth remain profitable and remain competitive in the marketplace. So um, just as a sort of brief summary around what I mean by smart content. Smart content is creating content that can exist in its own right. And you build smart from an outside content point of view. So with the metadata, ensuring that all of the relevant information is attributed to that piece of content. That could be you know, the rights associated with it. That could be to do with the context in which that content is being used in this particular initiative, but constantly updated wherever that sort of piece of content um, may end up residing in different product initiatives, in data APIs, you just don't know where it's going to end up because you just don't know what your business objectives may be a month, six months, a year down the road. 
But equally, the content needs to be smart from the inside. So what we're seeing as a trend is a massive emergence of semantic enrichment. So building enriched value within the content itself. So rather than it just being a think piece or some um, sort of full leadership or an article, actually building in semantics, and we are seeing as a, as a trend this year, is really coming to maturity. So rather than it just being a great idea from the IT department, we were like, hey, we've got a triple store, we can do trendy semantic stuff actually bending that in so that um, editorial teams are benefiting from having um, the ability to enrich content and you can do an awful lot more at the point of consumption if you're able to achieve that. Does that make sense? So, second one. So I call this content discovery rather than calling it search. And this is the trend that we are seeing. Just being able to search for content is no longer good enough. Um, you actually need to facilitate accurate, useful discovery of content. It's no longer good enough to require staff or consumers to go on a Sherlock Holmes kind of journey just to find the bit of content they were looking for. In fact, you have to turn it around to be proactively highlighting potential relevant content even though they didn't realise that they were searching for that. And once again, behind the scenes, this is where you're seeing a lot of semantic search come into a lot of the search-based, content discovery-based projects. And what that allows you to do is if somebody starts putting in search terms, or even smarter, if somebody starts writing in an authoring tool, you start automatically suggesting to them, were you aware that this other content existed and is relevant to either what you're looking for or is relevant to what you've just started writing and allowing access to that. And if, if you're not both putting these into the, the consumption devices or the consumption products, you're going to have a challenge. But equally from a staffing point of view, internal within the publishing organisation, this facilitates far more efficiency and truly, truly actually starting to get reviews for content. It's always been a line item in a board report to say, if we invest in this particular technology platform, we're going to be able to reuse our content and we're going to save 20% of our time. But actually, what we've seen a lot is it doesn't ever happen and nobody actually gets more efficient. And this is why we've seen a real focus on ensuring that search and discovery of content becomes so much more effective is becoming a business changer and if you're not able to provide that as a service you're in a lot of trouble. So the third trend that we are seeing and once again this is across the board is in the boardroom, from a publishing point of view, a necessity to really focus on what actually are we here for, what actually is our unique selling proposition as the publisher, and what should we be focusing on in terms of our time, our effort and our money, and making a distinction to um, come to the market to say, actually, this is what we're about, this is how we're going to stand out for the crowd. Highly important if you're in a particular aspect of publishing where self-publishing is um, an option for people that you interact with. How can you create more value as the publishing organisation? How can you demonstrate value? And so what we are seeing as another trend is this focus on defining this is who we are, this is what we do really well, and this is what we're going to continue doing really well. So to give you an example, we work a lot in education. So with a lot of the educational publishers, and what you're seeing is um, 
organisations, rather than we have content, and rather than selling to you as print textbooks, we can now give it to you in a digital format, not good enough. What you're seeing is we actually really know and understand the whole world of education. We know how to effectively facilitate learning, and we're going to prove it. Yeah, we're going to focus on really efficient learning. If you come to us to get your content, we can start demonstrating how effective and improvement you're going to see in the learning community with people who are consuming our content. Do you see the difference? It's a complete focus. And so within the, within the publishing organisation, suddenly hard decisions are needing to be made. Prioritisation is needing to be made to say, we're going to stop doing this, maybe we'll sell off this, because our prime focus, we need to demonstrate to the market that we are actually alive and viable, and this is what we stand for as an organisation going forward. I'm not sure if it's politically correct even to say marriage these days, but I did. So, um, what I mean by this is, coupled with a lot of those other trends that I was talking about, what we are seeing is as organisations are evaluating who they are, what they should be doing, what they should be focusing on, equally, that also necessitates a view on, is there smarter ways for us to be working? Just because we've always done it in this way in the past, is that the right recipe for the future? And nine times out of ten, the answer is, well, no. You need to be looking at doing things differently. And you know, our background is as a supplier to publishing organisations. So for years, historically, our world has been, Mr. Publisher has decided that this year, we're going to buy ourselves a shining subscription system. Or this year, we've decided we need a new editorial system. Or, no, 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 this year, we're going to have a digital asset management system. <coughs> and the publishing organisation will allocate a team internally, they'll produce a really beautiful RFP, multiple pages, lots of questions, are issue it to the market. And what they're basically saying is, all the suppliers out there, would you please put your best foot forward to do a project for us for a given price? Thank you very much. And it's kind of like this one stage um, activity that goes on. The problem with that is it's highly inefficient. Um, and if you are trying to focus on your USP, there's an awful lot of work you need to be doing just to become really good at your particular discipline in publishing. Trying to be a complete ecosystem of um, acquisition and projects and overseeing those, what we are seeing is there's now a shift in the thinking to say, is there smart ways that we could partner um, at multiple levels? So from our point of view, we've had um, publishing organisations sitting down with us to say, actually, let's think about this differently. If we have to invest in technology, if you happen to be experts in technology, why would we try and replicate your business? I've got no intention of trying to become a leading educational publisher. My focus is carrying on growing my business and being really good at what we do. And so we've started sitting there, scratching their heads and going, I think there's something in this. Actually, if we put together a three-year partnership, and we define what a good business relationship is. Now, this is interesting. A good business relationship means that both parties get out of that relationship something of value to them. And if you can structure a partnership where both parties are getting out of it something beneficial, that partnership can grow exponentially. If you skew it too far, one way or the other, somebody is going to get unhappy some point down the road and it will all fall apart and it shouldn't have started in the first place. So focusing on a partnership 
um, and looking at it from a holistic point of view in a sensible, grown-up, mature way makes a lot of sense. And so what we're seeing is this sort of shift to saying, well, if we partnered with you to look at transitioning our organisation, because we need to become a smart content, we need to become agile, we need to look at our sort of technology platforms, but then rather than this idea initially of oil the ocean, which is right, we've just we've just defined this huge project, and in two years' time, something's hopefully going to be delivered for a given price. What we see is a shift to say, no, break it down, become far more agile in a partnership. So within 12 weeks, let's have something new for our staff delivered live in production. And then 12 weeks later, let's have a subsequent phase, which is adding additional functionality. And then 12 weeks later, let's have some more bankable functionality that's making a real difference to our staff. Because what we've seen time and time again is um, lack of trust within the organisation. You know, a publisher sitting there saying, nothing's changed for the past eight years, why should I even care about this new initiative, this new idea, this new thinking, it's never going to change. There is an inherent lack of belief in that a publisher is, can become agile enough and flexible enough to respond to market needs, to bring products into market. And if you are able to look at putting in place sort of partnerships with organisations where you're getting the best out of their capability, and they've got your best interests at heart because it's a long-term relationship, you will suddenly start to see very interesting things happening. So, for example, if you've got new product initiatives, rapidly being able to bring them to market, trialling them, and seeing if they are successful, if so, brilliant, invest further, or if they're not successful, excellent, fail fast. And all of these initiatives around a smart, flexible, agile partnership will allow you to achieve that. Okay, final one. Uh, breaking borders. So, one of the interesting things that digitisation has manifested on the world is the fact that if you don't have to worry about print production, if you don't have to worry about warehousing, if you don't have to worry about distribution, then frankly the planet is potentially your playground. And so you're seeing a massive um, increase in internationalisation of digital products going after digital markets. So just because you're the largest publisher in a continental European country doesn't mean you're safe because others are looking at your territory and figuring out how could they effectively do some sort of translation. So that is one aspect of um, an international sort of marketplace. But more interestingly, what we're also seeing, this tends to be on the larger sort of mature publishing organisations, is historically a very, very similar product has been created multiple times in multiple geographies, in multiple languages, and actually when they sat back to say, what should we be doing, and looking at this idea of breaking borders, suddenly light bulbs are going on right now to say, oh, what we could do is create one really good product and just localise it where we need to, and therefore be far more cost effective and profitable. The challenge with that is we're then looking at global workflows, global collaboration, and the need for teams to be able to work digitally on a global basis in different countries. All I would say is don't underestimate just how tricky that can become, but it is entirely possible, and that is what we are seeing happening right now with organisations working smarter and coming up with new product initiatives that break through their traditional um, boundaries with a view to um, taking on new markets and actually things being able to sort of bring in house where before they've just outsourced it or syndicated out content to a different market. Now, looking at the parts of the possible with things like being able to work globally and being able to be effective 
um, it suddenly changes some of your um, business propositions in the marketplace and can um, make a significant difference to you know, the, the financial reports at the end of the year. Um, I'm conscious that I'm, I've got two minutes left. Is there any questions that anyone wants me to answer within two minutes? Brilliant. So, thank you for listening. Um, as I said, those are just some of my thoughts. You may agree with them, you may disagree with them. If you do want to um, verbally abuse me or tell me I'm ridiculous, then feel free and email me at doing such a thing. Um, or if you wish to get violent, then you'll find all of my team at the stand over at Ixus and just take it out on them. But thank you very much for listening, and I hope that was uh, useful. Thank you.